Hi, I'm James Maud. I'm a security researcher here at Beyond Trust. A uh, bit of a background of escaping ap academia and coming into companies and doing various things in cybersecurity, from identity management to uh, preventing bot attacks against websites. So, all sorts of bits and pieces. And uh, we're particularly pleased to be having you on today, Leah, because I was looking through the notes earlier in the bio for yourself, and I read. Vice President of Cybersecurity Specialist at MasterCard, co-founder of Whole Cyber Human Initiative, co-founder and co-host of the CISO Diaries podcast, and a chapter leader for the North Texas Cloud Security Alliance. And I'm guessing there's probably a few other bits and pieces of mentoring and speaking as well along the way. So um, I've heard things are bigger in Texas and your career seems to be representative of that. So welcome uh, and thanks for joining us today. No, thank you guys for the opportunity. It's um, good to be here. and. Yeah, I'm excited for the conversation. Must be strange being on the other side of the fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, yeah, it's fun. There's a definitely a lot going on, but um, you know, it's I'm just trying to give back and contribute for all those who helped me along my way in my career, right? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, sp speaking of career, I'd really love to know right at the start, how did you get into technology? What did that journey look like? Yeah, good question. So. Oh, wow. Um, let's see. Well, before living in Texas, which I've only been here for three years now, I grew up in California, Silicon Valley. So I was born and raised there and started my career there. So no matter what, I think, um, even though I didn't, I, I fell into um, my path non-traditionally, although I can see now where the skill sets have actually helped me <laughs> get, get to where I am today. And so I started my career in public relations and communications, but I was always working with tech for technology companies. So um, my first company that I was at, it was a smaller one. Um, I think they got acquired since, and it was semiconductors, right? So, uh, you know, the, the semiconductor chips within um, cellular base stations, right? Um, so I always had to understand technology from the get-go, um, albeit more of the business uh, side of it. And then taking the you know technical jargon and translating it into what everyone else can understand. So um, it, when the, let's see, along my way, I was at Cisco for three years, and during that time, I worked with a lot of different business units and groups. And we had, let's see, for security, then the head of the security team business unit at Cisco was when I was there was. Chris Young, who had gone on, of course, to be the CEO of McAfee, right? And now he's at Microsoft. But that's where I got into cybersecurity. Um, I was working with the, um, different business groups, including the cybersecurity team. And, you know, I was always interested in technology in general. And always, for me, it was all about, I'm a very visual person. So if I have to get my hands on the technology to understand it more, I will do that, right? And you can Pretty much, I think anyone can go into companies now, no matter no, no matter no matter what position you're in. And if you're interested and you want to learn, and you go up to the engineering team or you know any groups um, who are technical, and you say, "I want to learn how that works," will you show me? They're a happy to show you, and two, if you say you want to help them, they will definitely take your help. So I did a lot of that, and and that's um, pretty much where I start transitioning more and more on the more technical side of things. Amazing. It sounds like you're just surrounded by awesome people in your career and really like, you know, at the forefront of everything in Silicon Valley. That, that just sounds like an incredible start. I was lucky. <laughs> yeah, you're very lucky. You're very blessed. Um, was there anything that really hooked you when it came to the cybersecurity side of things? Do you mention like semiconductors and technology and to networking and then leaning more into cybersecurity? What, what made you realize cybersecurity was like, for you? Yeah, a couple things. I think one was, you know, it was always the conversations with IT, right, um, at the table. And they had a lot of budget, <laughs> or a lot more, I'd say, than cyber, what I discovered later on, right, with cybersecurity. Um, and they had just a lot of initiatives that they were doing and, and some, you know, pretty cool innovation, right? And, and things have definitely changed and evolved since even when I started my career till here we are today, right? Um, it, so one of the things I, I remember always coming up, but it wasn't necessarily that those folks would be at the table were, you know, the security around all of it, right? Um, and then I started thinking more and more about, yeah, 
what about securing all of it? And, and this makes sense because if, if we're going to look at, you know, the evolution here and things that we're doing, and I mean, I was in the era too of just, you know, things were being like tested then, but well, test it in the commercial space, right? In mm. sense versus this has always been probably going on for years prior in government, for example, but, you know, um, mobile apps and, and using them where businesses like say an MGM resorts, <laughs> right. Would use it to kind of, if you're on their Wi-Fi, they can track you if you sign up opt in. Right. And, and then you can literally be walking by, um, a store and because you opted in and you, there's some interest that you, they, they saw that you took, then they would flag you and pop up with an ad right away. Right. And, and you're right in front of the store and you're like, Oh, look at that 20% off because here I am. <laughs> um, and, and, but you think about the, the, um, the privacy and security concerned concerns around all of that. Right. And I was always kind of interested in that aspect is what does that look like? And then more of that got me to, um, and where I, I like more, wherever I can bring people together who maybe you wouldn't typically see those groups together at the table or in the conversations. But I liked doing that because I always had a way of being able to understand and connect the dots with different people, different groups, different organizations. And so when I started saying, OK, there's all IT at the table, but where's security and you're implementing this, right? Um, and then I'm talking to the security team and, and they would say, we're not in those conversations. We'd love to be, and we'd like to know what's happening before it's even deployed so that we can have a plan in place, right? Um, and I think I was just fascinated in that aspect to understand more about how do you um, get security involved in the conversations? What does that look like? How can you have kind of a more broader plan? And, you know, I, I was probably the one, and I was younger in my career at the time, where I would just get the gut feeling instinct. I, I do. I operate a lot by my intuition, right? And had to learn over time, back it up by data, facts, and research. Because if you say something that, you know, even if it's right, you know, instinctually, um, when you're talking to people who, you know, especially technical folks, they need to see the data too, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just go by a, well, it was just a hunch, right? Even if in six weeks or two years, they're like, ah, oh, you were right, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I liked, I was the one who just would go in and bring the people together and they would kind of ask and, you know, up front, um, not when they were in the same room, but why are you doing this? You know, I probably compete with them or they would take budget or whatever else, but I knew it was right. And so I would do it. Um, and you know, then I just got smarter about backing up my intuition <laughs> and hunches with the data, you know, to support. So then they wouldn't question me. They'd say, it makes sense. It just hasn't been done before. Right. So, um, yeah. And I, you know, I have a big understanding for, well, if I know how something works from a, you know, systemically, um, I want to know all of how it works, right. Where, not just where it stops, but what else has to be threaded through, right? And then as you mm. as you know, security threads through every piece of technology, right? I think that's a, a really good take on it. One of the problems we often see with organizations is people are talking about security is a department or even worse in some cases, security is a technology or product that you buy and bolt on. Um, obviously you've made a career about proving that. What do, you, what do you think some of the key barriers there for companies to get over and start to do those things that you're talking about? Yeah, you know, it's definitely, I think, fast forward, you know, from my time at Cisco, what, 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago, <laughs> um, to now, it's gotten better, right? I think there's um, much more at the uh, table. You've got both both, both of the teams. Um, I think, too, even looking at uh, when companies would go through cloud migrations, right? Security is part of that now. It has to be, right? And we've got so much in cloud security that's evolved and still changing and, and going in the direction we need it to. Um, but I think a bigger part has been, whereas, you know, the role of the CISO even is not as, um, has not been around for as long as, say, the CIO or the CTO. And now that it's becoming more prominent that we have, big issues and big challenges in cybersecurity. I mean, it's impacting every single person, whether we're in the field or not, right? Um, it's impacting our kids. It's impacting people's lives when you look at, you know, a couple of the hospitals that were attacked and it, it was, you know, patient lives on, on the line, so to speak, right? 
And I think because of that, and not to say that we want to see in the news all the time, the headlines with the breaches and, and hear about those companies that got attacked. But at the same time, I think it's, it's drawing the awareness that we need to have cybersecurity as part of the business, right? They can enable the business. And that's where, you know, the, there's parts of me who m might have some regrets along the way of, you know, should I have gone in a different way into cybersecurity? But at the same time, I think about it now, and the biggest thing of getting the, um, the support from the broader business executives and teams and the board in companies, right, is the narrative. And how do you relate what you're doing so that they can understand the impact to business and how you can enable them? And because I've always had to, in my career, understand the business first, technology second, um, Th those are the skill sets now that I'm like, ah, I'm glad I have those now. <laughs> and, and I think we, we see more of that need um, and, and more of the conversations actually happening to br bring that bridge it all together. Definitely feel like you're, you're ahead of the times there. And I think we can all look back and say, oh, I think uh, maybe a different entry point would have been good for my cybersecurity career too. But I'm just so glad you're in it and bringing that passion to it. That's something that really comes through when you, you talk about this. Um, you mentioned that kind of having things in the language of the business, and I think a big part of that is risk. You know, sometimes that can be seen as something interesting, stimulating. Other times it's got kind of other connotations. But how do you and, and what do you currently do to kind of learn more about risk and the way to have those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, luckily, some of these new mandates and regulations are helping, I think, right? Because it's it's not specific to just cyber, but it it's um, addressing all business risk, right? And I think that's where if we can, you know, cyber, I'll say just cyber risk assessments in general, right? It's been around for a while. But I think if we look at how do you take it so that it's not just more of a technical, tactical type of a tool and approach, right? But really more of the, the business approach of it. Um, and that's where I think it starts. And also... You know, it's it's looking at there is risk to every organization, even outside of cyber, right? IT, financial, um, legal. And so there are different groups within a company that will be working on, say, risk assessments. And I think when you can have co collaboration and conversations with them and then also share what you're doing in the cyber risk piece of it and bring that all together to be one comprehensive view um, I don't know if we're there yet. I, I think it might be starting to happen at some places or some people are realizing that, yes, that's what we need to do. Um, I think that that's um, a huge evolution that we can take and a, an approach that will get cybersecurity more prominence to at, at the table and be part of just part of the group, right? Versus always be, being seen as, well, maybe they're not here because we have this person here instead or this group. It's not the same, right? We need all of them together. Um, that, Yeah, that's my biggest take. I think, you know, we're. I will say cyber risk is a topic I've probably been hearing the last two years, way more so than ever. <laughs> you know, each event I go to and the panelists I listen to and a lot of the CISOs, um, I think some of the big things, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the SEC, right? That's this week, the week of May 9th, so... Um, and then I think um, the government and, you know, CISA and others are doing a really good job because when you look at now the time to even report on an incident, right, it's what, 36 hours or mm. potentially 24 hours. I think that's going to drive a lot of the hopefully behavior, right? And then if we can look at, you know, continuous assessments, <laughs> I'll say, um, you know, it's no longer just, no, not once a quarter, not, you know, once a year. We need to do it ongoing, right? Because if we have a better view um, into what is actually at risk and then a way to prioritize for projects and budget, even better, right? So I think it's headed in the right direction, but we have a lot more work to do. I, I love that view of the continuous assessment as well, because let's, let's face it, people change faster than once a quarter, technology changes faster than once a quarter, and so do processes. So I, I think what a great view and, and point there you've made. I think I, I really like that because you've you've got the almost the ability to crowdsource that with your podcast, um, the CISO Diaries, right? I mean, yeah. How how long and how many people have you spoken to about these types of topics on that? 
Oh yeah. Uh, well, I've been probably talking to people, you know, people for a long time just by way of my career. But um, you know, I will say there's always the interest. To, I always just want to learn more, right? I'm never going to stop learning. And to do that, you need to sometimes have the conversations directly with the people, you know, in the in the roles or doing specific things. And the great thing about I think our community is everyone is willing to share and talk, right? And come to I, I think we're definitely coming together more and helping each other and supporting each other. Um, I know the CISO Diaries podcast, it'll be almost a year in August, I guess. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. a, thank you. It's a you know, it's it's a fun thing to do on the side and it gives you know us the chance to talk to folks in the field and um it's nice to just have the conversation right um share exchange um i think we need a lot more of that i think definitely less blaming in the field <laughs> and more sharing sharing and helping and supporting because no one none of us can say we're an expert right well i can't i'm not an expert <laughs> you know i'm trying to learn as much as i can and i know maybe some things more than others but and i'll pass that knowledge on but i am still every day i learn something new that's awesome that's great there's a thread isn't there that's that's going through all, all your narrative about your career there about bringing communities not only within an organization and you know bridging silos and organizational units but also you can see with some of the work you've done with building external communities and uh, you know infosec meetup groups and the podcasts and various other bits and pieces there one of, one of the things that i think is quite relevant here as well is some of the responses around things like we've seen the log for j vulnerability and the the panic in businesses as they suddenly realize they will do we have this? What components is it in? Are they used? Suddenly, lots of people who maybe hadn't been thinking about security are having to grapple with these things and these these concepts. So, was that something you became actively involved in? Did you see people really struggling to to handle those things? Yeah, um, and you know, I can't say too much in detail, but um, at the time, um, I was having to go through, um, you know the remediation of, of some of the impact, right, that we saw with uh, log for shell um, It was, well, I think we're still seeing the impact of it, right? Um, and I mean, it was found in systems everywhere, even the consumer systems, right, like Minecraft, which I remember calling up my brother and sister-in-law because my niece and nephew play Minecraft, right? So I'm walking them through what they should do and look for. Um, Microsoft, Salesforce, so many more. Um, I don't know. I can say, were we completely prepared for that? Um, personally, and where I was at at the time, no, we weren't. Um, did we have a full understanding of what it was? No. And I don't know that a lot of people did, right? But what I did see, and you know, maybe this has been, I mean, and we're kind of talking about, uh, you know, a big one that was in the headlines, right? But I think the bigger they are and when they are in the headlines and when they're at, of the degree that, whoa, haven't really seen this one before, right? That's where I think it's as much as it's not ideal, <laughs> it shows us one, okay, these attacks are getting more sophisticated and, and we're seeing new strains and you know threads of them that we haven't seen before, right? So all of us are having to figure it out. And I think when you have that sort of a, um, situation, then there's a lot more room for people to jump in. And if they're, if they're sharing information to help, you know, guide people who are trying to learn and support, um, that's where it's, it's critical, right? I think we need to work more together. We need to help each other out, support each other. It was the same thing with the pandemic, right? It was the first time, I mean, for a lot of us in our lives, every aspect, not even just cybersecurity, but you know, and, and that's why it's so important to be part of groups and communities because you need to share with each other and you need to have a group to turn to to say, okay, I was impacted. Um, this is what happened. I'm looking to do A, B, and C. Did I miss anything? What are the other best practices that, you, you know, someone else is doing that maybe we can pull from, right? And then share and give in return. Um, and I think that's crucial. So I will thank some of the Slack channels and discords I'm on and a part of because, you know, when I have questions that I'm like, okay, I'm a little stumped, even though, you know, I've gotten myself so far on figuring it out or my team or whatever, then can always go to those channels and, and ask some questions and 
everyone jumps in with support and everyone's sharing, right? And it's, it's all about that. It's, let's do more of that because uh, no one person can solve this. Mm. Absolutely. And a lot of the time, these things are very much moving targets that maybe there's an initial disclosure and people trying to work out what the risk and then by the, you know, the exploit code's released and then someone finds another version, variant of it after you've patched one variant of it, things like this. I think what's really interesting with your story is that you touched on it, that you were dealing with, you know, relatives, Minecraft servers, and you're dealing with it, uh, you know, obviously without going into details, a, a company. And then you've obviously got experience at larger companies, you know, you're currently with MasterCard. So what do you think the difference is between, you know, smaller companies dealing with this who maybe don't have the security resources right up to the, the big enterprise players having to handle it? Are there are commonalities there that we can, lessons that we can learn? I do. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of um, free support and resources out there for the smaller companies um, and the mid-sized ones. You know, I, there's a number of uh, organizations. I think the FBI has something now, right, for small businesses. And even regionally, I know for Dallas, the, the chapter here, or the bureau here, um, they have a lot that they do and resources they provide. And they encourage small businesses all throughout the state or, you know, within the DFW community to go to them. Um, another organization is a nonprofit called Cyber Future Foundation. They're setting up resources and support for small businesses. So I think if those companies don't have resources, they, they certainly can go find them now and get the support and help. I know there's also groups that get set up kind of, sort of like FEMA, right? When we respond to national emergencies, um, now there's groups for cybersecurity with volunteers that will be ready. It, you know, whether you sign up in the state you're in, um, you can be deployed essentially deployed, right, or available to support and help nationally. And so I think it's great when we see companies in states or organizations rolling out efforts like that. And that's a good way, by the way, for anyone who wants to continue to upscale to get involved and volunteer. Um, and sometimes those groups will help to give, you know, vouchers or discounts for um, this security certification. So it can really help everybody. Um, and then I think, obviously, you know, if you look at managed services or an MSSP or other organizations, sometimes having a service provider can help as well. But I know not everyone has resources and budget, but if there's, there's probably ways to make something work, right, to get the help that they need. And there's so much more out there now than I think there were even 15 years ago. Yeah. And I think a lot of the lessons maybe that were learned around Log4j that we perhaps should have learned in the past with like Heartbleed and the OpenSSL issues, where there's these widely used technologies is organizations don't know if they're vulnerable a lot of time. They they haven't done that risk assessment, which brings us back to the kind of the risk conversation and how you convey that to business because everyone's suddenly interested when it's hitting the headlines and or you've been breached. But how do you approach that? How do you think about when you're talking to the, the peers or the board or management about these things? How do you get them into a mindset of thinking we need to be prepared for these unknown things? Yeah. Well, one, I think you need to find out what um, know your current risk situation, right? Your scoring and what, what are the key things that um, would be the highest priority to fix now, right? Because you're not going to be able to achieve everything, um, but you have to be able to prioritize. I think when you can have quantification or the financial um, impact analysis, that's really helpful, right? Because any um, organization from the executive team to the board, they all know what um, financial loss looks like, right? Mm. And financial savings, right? <laughs> um, in terms of operating a business. And then I think, you know, equating it into the business terms, right? Where, okay, if say a web browser is vulnerable, well, why do you need to um, look and address that and get resources and, and or budget to fix that, right? And put a plan into place. Well, because if that website goes down and you're a company who does e-commerce, then that's your business, right? So it, it is equating it into business terms. And I think it's taking the data and, and the results of um, your assessments and your risk overall and translating it into the business. I like that proactive. Like let, let's try and get data points that we can show that if we actually invest in these projects, it's going to reduce the amount of attacks that, that could affect us and impact us as an organization obviously that doesn't happen all of the time like we live in a, a real world with capped budgets and things but what would you say would be your kind of top three pieces of advice for someone who does have to initially deal with an attack 
you know, maybe use log for shell is the kind of example there. Who who does have to deal with the attack? Yeah, like as an incident responder, like what what's the kind of first thing that or first three things you'd recommend somebody do or or look at to deal with the attack? Yeah, great question. You know, um, I guess if it's happened or you know, essentially about to, or you think or anything is imminent, right? Um, but always check your systems, right? Check your systems, especially with software. You know, check your list of any vulnerable software. You know, set up all your rules, have your web application firewall rule, rules set up, check for your scanning. And the, back to the continuous um, assessments, I think that's really important because when you're doing that on an ongoing basis, because the threat landscape is changing so fastly and so are the threat actors, right? Especially in this heightened geopolitical time that we're living in, having a constant readout is going to better help you be more preventative. That's one. Number two, um, have a remediation plan in place, right? Um, and then I'd say number three, um, understand where, have, have an assessment too on your team. Where are they all at in their skill sets and their levels with their job roles, right? Are there still things that they, you know, could benefit from learning or doing? And then have that kind of professional development set up so that they're continued to, continuing to learn in their roles and get um, the access they need to learning and trainings so that they, um, you know, I don't think we can use the, we want to use the excuses anymore. Well, oh, it was someone who was junior who had lower skill sets, right? As managers of a team, it is our responsibility to make sure that we're giving a career pathway and upskilling to those team members. So those would be my big three. That's great. And then one of the things that often happens when an incident like this takes hold, especially when it's in the media, is widespread panic ensues and communication protocols go out the window as everyone starts firing off emails. So how how do you advise people to reassure the business? How can you go about reassuring people that this attack isn't the end of the world? Like possibly that it is the end of the world, but we have a procedure for this. How do you maintain those clear communications and get that reassurance and, and message out there? Pull together a, a narrative, a brief, right? Make it really succinct, um, just the facts. Um, you know factually report on what is currently the situation, what is happening more broadly, you know, with within the landscape, the, you know, because it's not just, say, your organization that's that's being impacted and or at risk. So put it into context of the broader scope and then put into um, add to that. Well, what is that call to action that the team is doing to assure that um, everything is being um, put into place with protective and preventive measures? um according to you know as to the best that they can the the communication transparency i think is the key to everything right um because having that is that leaves no surprises you yeah. you can't say well whoa this came out of left field right if mm. you have that constant communication and transparency and understanding no a good mentor of mine said if in doubt over communicate yes you can never over communicate <laughs> yes it's great. Now, one of the things I did think about is think think about the people involved. Have you ever have you ever come across people that might be too scared or you know too much pride that they want to ask for help in that situation? And what advice would you give to someone who's perhaps been in that situation? Yeah, uh, um, frequently, yes, um, and myself included at one point in time in my career. Right, I didn't want to ever ask for help because I thought, well, maybe I'd have a question that that sounded stupid, right? Um, or that, oh, I should know this. <laughs> um, so I would say get over the ego there and and don't be afraid to ask for help and or questions because I don't think, you know, for the fear I had, once I got over that, anytime I asked, no one ever said, well, that's a dumb question or you should know that, right? Nobody's thinking like that. I think that's our own internal fear, fear and struggle. So just know ask and get the help because if you don't you don't want to be in the predicament that um where you could have actually prevented it by asking and, and reaching out and that's why quite frankly there's so many um i think groups and you know even at conferences now they have the workshops right kind of tabletop exercises and people to get together and i think that's really the the time to you know be involved and, and voice your questions and share as well um and, and learn and take away to help you 
Um, that's what it's there for. Everyone needs help and support. And I don't think anyone will sit there and say, nope, I need no help. I've got it all together. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's interesting you mentioned the, the kind of communities that have come together around these types of events and these types of kind of impactful vulnerabilities and attacks. How do you think the communities change when they've been through something like this together? Do they get stronger? Do they get closer? It uh, Yes. And a lot more, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but on LinkedIn, a lot more sharing, right? And transparency. I think in the last, I'll say 10 years, um, you know, there's been people who have put out like full manifestos, right? That will detail out everything. Hey, if you got Im hit or impacted, Here's some things that you can do and steps to take. And we had to do it too, right? It happened to us. And I think that it's it's a whole new level almost to some degree, which is great, right? Because if you are just at least following and connected to people in cybersecurity these days and the, the vendors, I think there were more and more vendors are getting better too about um, quickly pulling together information and, and even the full on, you know, just facts of, of the incident itself. and that helps a lot of CISOs and organizations to be able to pull from. I know you, you've mentioned in previous conversations that, especially around Log4J, as we're sort of rounding off that topic, that someone had put together, like you were talking about, a, lot, a large document of useful information. So do you know, just want to mention what that's all about and where people can find that? Yeah. Um, wow. I'd have to think back to some of the, these. Um, you know, CISA also has a good repository and resource. Um, I think, well, I'll give it for the current context now, even with um, what's happening with, you know, Ukraine and Russia. Um, there's a lot of updates consistently on CISA. Um, and then, you know, I look at some of the other big players. Um, Mandiant has continued to post uh, education materials and such. And, you know, I know it's, it, we all want to say, well, where is everything in one place, right? I think that's hard. Will we ever get to one repository for everything? But at the same time, um, you know, a lot of good contents out there. I think I'd say start with the vendors you work with today, right? Um, they most of the time will have something in place already or prepare, prepared. Um, that's a great place to start. And then some of these more, you know, larger governing body um, nonprofit entities that are um, keeping track and um, constantly posting notifications, that's another good place. And then, yeah, start with your vendors because they they likely will have something for you. Absolutely. And a, a shout out to the NCSC in the UK as well, who uh, published quite a lot of good information. This is the joy, right? We're seeing all these yeah. different governments around the world all spinning up resources to help their own countries, but cyber is universal. So, you know, we can go and look at all these other governments' websites and find useful bits of information. I found um, the Recorded Future Insight group as well was pretty good. Like covering some kind of background intelligence as to why those situations happen, like re really great kind of resource there. Um, what, one of the things, I, I like thinking to kind of some of your your answers there, this feels like it's becoming more of a regular occurrence when big vulnerabilities are out there and incidents are happening. Have you helped kind of directly contribute to these types of things and? What, what can others do to find those Slack groups channels and how can they be a part of that? Yeah, a great question. Um, I've helped some, you know, I, mostly I do it. I'll do it on LinkedIn and I'll take some of the publishings and I am pretty good about, well, we all should be good about this, right? But whenever you reference anyone's work or um, pull from a company to kind of get everything into one document, Make sure everyone references and cites it, right? Obviously, because we want to, I think, just attribute to the great work that's out there already. Um, that's very important. But I've done mostly mine within the LinkedIn group. So um, Cloud Security Alliance for the North, North Texas chapter um, on our podcast LinkedIn group. But the discords, um, let's see, Slack channels, there's a few of them. It's under like the CISO community, or if you follow, um, I'm forgetting the big one on LinkedIn. I'll have to give it to you guys. I can send links if you want to include them as part of the recording or, you know, part of this conversation. Show notes or something. Time. But there's so many out there and I can't remember all the names exactly, right? I just know I'm part of them. Um, but LinkedIn is a great source. Twitter, right, as well. And I think if you even if you just type in 
cybersecurity discord channel or slack you'll pull up so many of them it's just a matter of which one is right for you to join and then some of them are by geo right where you might see a large larger say for me the ones i'm in it's a larger us presence but they have them globally they have you know uk dedicated ones so um i'd say start with linkedin because they're all out there i just can't remember all the names of the ones i'm part of oh i imagine the list is so long as well yeah. so no, great, great advice there as well. Um, I guess last kind of really functional question on vulnerabilities, incident response attacks, what that looks like. As a as a smaller organization like a nonprofit, what would be some kind of proactive steps you would recommend? So you mentioned like obviously in the in the midst of an attack, you know, inventory systems, understand what's out there, share, over communicate. Actually, what are some kind of act, actionable steps or controls that you'd recommend to be as secure as possible for a smaller organization? The basics, right? MFA, <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, secure VPNs. Um, it, it also, here's one to think about because um, I've seen it happen before and I think it should be, um, you know, I want to share this, right? But some nonprofits, actually, I was at a startup once who um, we used Google for mail, right? Um, and that quickly changed at some point, right? When <laughs> we got a head of security who said, what are you guys doing? Um, but it, it, they were using their Gmail accounts, right? Um, for communicating. I mean, very, very small. And then they realize, hey, there's sensitive information that's going across. There's a lot of um, data that we're exchanging and it's private. So um, they switched over and they became a Microsoft shop, right? Um, and you get some of the security measures and protection there when you can do that. Um, actually, Microsoft has a group with an organization within the company that will give support with technologies and services and help stand up, um, say, a Outlook, for example, um, for small business and nonprofits. So I would say any um, smaller business who's not doing the basics or who's maybe on some systems um, communicating and exchanging information, email that's not secure, make sure you either have security protection there and or are reaching out to organizations that can help do it at a minimum to no cost because that's part of their they have a group within that dedicates um, resources to that. That's really good advice. And uh, and just know there's so many people out there and so many nonprofits and charities, you know, I've worked with a few in the past where they've just assumed they weren't an attack vector because why would someone go after us? And then obviously ransomware explodes on the scene and everyone's a target. And it's not always even the organization that's being targeted. Sometimes they're going after the clients of that organization. So it, it can be really difficult. One of the ongoing themes with cybersecurity is we don't have enough people, we don't have enough skill sets, we, we need to do all these things to improve things. And yet at the same time, we're often our own worst enemies in the cybersecurity industry because we're looking for people who are experienced developers or they've, they've got lots of technical experience. But as you've said, you've charted a very successful career by joining together the dots, connecting people, getting to know these technologies without necessarily coming from a technological background. So how do you think we can help more people into cybersecurity like yourself and broaden the skill set of cybersecurity professionals. Yeah, and this could be a whole nother topic for a podcast, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it has to start in different levels of our lives as well, right? I think you need to look at it where let's look at our schools today um, and where are there opportunities to bring in a curriculum and or, you know, key learning initiatives for kids, right? Because these days, most kids, even starting before kindergarten, are on a device, right? Whether they're playing games on it, using it, however, they're using technology. Um, so start with looking at schools. Where can we be part of, you know, and, and this takes parents, too, of schools, right? There are a lot of schools. I'll take the U.S., for example. Some countries are further ahead than us. There's a lot of great work in the U.K. happening that I know of, Australia, other parts of the world. But look at currently where can we help? Um, cause it takes partnership, right? Industry partnership to work collaboratively, um, with schools and get kids focused on, you know, STEM, IT security programs and, and careers and part of the competition so that they're getting that skilling early on. And when the industry 
partners can work with schools, then I think they can help make sure some of that learning is more closely aligned to the workforce. That's key. Um, and then there's, I'd say it's probably exploded in the last few years that I've seen with the whole market around a number of companies and organizations that are providing training, right? Training in different areas. Now you have, you know, ICS, um, SCADA, focus on, you know, all new areas within cybersecurity, critical infrastructure. But, you know, and that's one of the things that um, Whole Cyber Human Initiative does is we basically put together a free program 